board. A brief overview of the budget development process and following the overview, Mr. Clark will provide you with a more detailed description of the budget and respond to any questions you may have. With the development of the budget, it is important that the budget reflects the district's vision and mission. The vision sets the course and direction for the district by describing what we, what we believe we must become. The mission of our school district describes our purpose and focuses directly on the service we provide our students. Throughout the 2013-14 budget development, our purpose has continually been focused on student learning and development. Specifically, we must educate and inspire students today and prepare them for tomorrow. Ensuring that all our students learn at high levels as they develop 21st century skills. So that our students have opportunities, we must continue to grow our partnerships with the entire community. And finally, we know that we must operate and act in a fiscally responsible manner while ensuring well-rounded educational experiences. The board developed and adopted core values that guide our behavior as an organization. We are committed to data-driven decision-making, focusing on results in student learning as we focus on academic excellence, high expectations for all students, lifelong learning, and personalized learning. Continuous improvement and we are committed to collaboration, a district-wide perspective, future orientation and innovation. Visionary leadership as we celebrate success, engage the community, have high expectations for all, and commit to service excellence. And respectful behavior by honoring diversity, acting with integrity, and being responsible. The district's four strategic objectives provide us with a framework for what we believe is most important in measuring our progress in meeting our vision and mission. Those four areas are student learning, where we will provide a rigorous, relevant curriculum and high quality instruction to prepare all students for the future. Fiscal sustainability, where we provide and sustain the highest level of student learning in a fiscally responsible manner. Performance excellence, where we adopt and demonstrate a district-wide, research-based, systematic, and aligned approach to improvement. And communication, where we will communicate with students, parents, staff, and community, utilizing accurate, meaningful, and timely methods. As we move forward with this budget, we will pay particular attention to the second strategic objective of fiscal sustainability. We believe it is, it is important for us to connect student performance with how we allocate our financial resources. There are multiple measurements that go into this goal. This goal is a unique measure as it puts together academic performance measures, specifically the Wisconsin Knowledge and Concepts Exam and also the ACT with a per pupil spending measure as determined by the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. For a number of years, the school district has operated on a school-based decision-making process, relying on the leadership at the building level and other program areas to establish the goals needed to meet the building or program mission and district mission. With that, the co constituent involvement is important to the process. The school board sets the budget limits and asks the administration to develop a budget based on the needs. And then the school board approves new items that come into the budget, which generally are on a prioritized basis. Over the years, the school board has established criteria that it asks administration to follow in developing the budget these include maintaining appropriate student-teacher ratio in the classroom, committing to the continual improvement and development of staff, enhancing the use of technology throughout the district. 
The district has really worked hard in the curriculum and instruction area and continues to focus on the evaluation component of the improvement process. Energy conservation continues to be a priority. The purchase and maintenance of the district's transportation fleet and maintaining our facilities is critical. Revenue limits are statutory requirements by the state that tell the district how much money they can put in their, in their budget and of course we must follow. In trying to stay under the limits, we still must meet all mandates. The positive impact on student achievement is always looked at when considering new programs. Maintaining a fund balance that meets the financial performance target approved by the board and necessary to meet all current financial obligations without borrowing from other funds or outside lenders. There is nothing more important to providing a quality learning and work environment than make sure our students and staff are healthy and safe. I already mentioned how we take into consideration the number of students impacted on any decision made and vacant positions are evaluated to make sure it still is necessary in order to provide the needed services. Just a quick review of the budget development timeline or the highlights of the timeline. The 2013-14 budget process started back in October 2012 with the board approving what actually was a modified or new process including the calendar. In November, administrators and supervisors submitted budgets along with unmet needs. In December, the board identified initial assumption input variables so that administration could develop a projected budget by looking at the anticipated revenue dependent on enrollment projections and costs based on prior year. The board approved a preliminary budget in February and a proposed budget in August. And looking ahead, the board will approve a final, or it would be called an original budget, and certify the levy at the second board meeting in October. A few observations to share with you. In 2012-13, we continued to respond to changes at the state level by making the necessary adjustments in our budget planning. Fortunately, due to a lot of hard work by our budget authorities and staff, we ended the 2012-13 budget year favorably. The surplus at the end of the year should not mean that it was an easy year and all our needs were met. In fact, we went into 2012-13 with continued cuts in place that impacted all our areas. With the budget challenges we have had to face, I was not confident that we should spend down any projected surplus on unmet needs in the spring. And as a result, we did end the year with a surplus. With the 2013-14 budget, the board approved in July a one-time expenditure to complete phase two of our wireless project in the district that will provide wireless access to all elementary schools. The 2013-14 budget also includes increases to annual allocations in a number of critical areas. The budget also includes additional one-time allocations that will help us address needs in which we have either not kept up with or we will be experiencing additional mandates that we must fund for this coming school year. As with last year, I will caution us as we move into the 2013-14 school year of several variables and unknowns at this time that could change our financial picture, beginning with student enrollment. We project an increase in the number of students compared to last year, but will not know for sure the number until the school year gets started and we look at the third Friday count in September. We are projecting an enrollment growth rate of around 1.5%, but again, I would caution everyone that numbers can continue to change as we begin the year. The board has examined the budget process and continues to look at potential ways to improve how we allocate and repurpose the dollars 
to areas believed to be most important in order to move us towards our vision. Increasing enrollment does, has an impact on us as we must manage increased needs in staffing and facilities, even though we receive only partial funding for the first two or three years. As a community, we have much to celebrate with the improvements of facilities, which is due to the wonderful support the home and area community has for our students. Identifying facility needs is ongoing for our school district and community as a result of our continued growth. We also need to maintain the facilities that we have in order to keep them in quality condition for our students and staff and to also prevent large expenses down the road. And I commend the board for approving uh, in the budget increased allocations to our buildings and grounds department. We continue to look at budget projections. We, continue to, we continually look at the initiatives in the school district and attempt to address those over time in order to continue to improve. Should mention that providing for a special population of students is an ongoing budget issue and an important one that this district should feel proud or be proud of what we do. Assessment continues to be an important focus as we help our staff understand how to best assess student learning and what actions to take to help students learn and be more successful. This will continue to be a priority for our staff development as we also focus on collaboration through our professional learning communities in order to share best practices in the classroom. Common core state standards, smarter balance assessment, educator effectiveness, those are just examples, a few examples of major initiatives that must be reflected in the budget. In conclusion, the budget must reflect the vision and mission of our school district. The budget places students first. While reflecting the input from constituents in the community, taking place at every level in the school district. The budget reflects a growing student population and the needs that come with growth. Great scrutiny takes place of the budget at each level to make sure we have taken any items out before we advance it into the coming school budget. Nothing is automatic as we continually prioritize the greatest needs beginning with maintaining the appropriate teaching levels as established by the board. This is an area I believe the board has expressed continued interest in making sure our dollars are being used in order to achieve our vision of educating every student to achieve global success. I believe the budget is fiscally responsible and yet we need to do more to address sustainability in some areas. So I hope I've been able to provide you with an overview of the process and Mr. Clark will now share with you a more detailed description of the budget itself. During this segment of the budget hearing, I'll be providing budget details and also allowing time for questions. Handout materials that you want to have at your side, because I'll be referring to them, are the blue budget uh, publication format and the buff uh, budget adoption format. There are also annual report documents in the back of the room, which have some of our fiscal performance measures, uh, and we'll be referring to those as well. I'll give you a, a heads up when we are going to refer to one of those um, three documents. Uh, during the presentation, I'll spend time talking about the proposed school mill rate uh, and the impact of that mill rate on property taxes. Uh, causes um, underlying the proposed mill rate changes from last year. Uh, talking about the annual meeting approval of the property tax levy and presenting you a potential resolution and then uh, talking through a few of the notable budget changes from last year's budget to the budget that's currently proposed for next year. Uh, the school tax rate that's projected at this time for next year is $11.79 per $100,000 of property value. 
Uh, this is the fair market value as listed on your property tax bill and not the assessed value. Um, the assessed value changes very infrequently infre on your property tax bill, only when you've been reassessed. But if you study the fair market value on your property tax bill, that changes almost annually as the Wisconsin Department of Revenue studies the sales of homes in communities and looks at how far above or below those sales figures are from the actual assessed value. And because of that, the fair market value, the value upon which your school tax is based, can change from year to year. And we'll talk through some specific illustrations of that later on. So at $11.79 per $1,000 of property value, you can see here an illustration of uh, what some potential property tax bills might be on a $100,000 property, $150,000 and $200,000 property. You know, um, 20 years ago when I came here, a $100,000 property value was a realistic single family home. And uh, that just doesn't work so much anymore. But we still present it because multiples of that. So if it's a $300,000 home, you can take the 100 and 200 and add them together and come up with what the school tax bill would be on a $300,000 home. So taking the $11.79 per thousand figure, multiplying it by the thousands of dollars. Uh, so for example, $100,000, you'd multiply 100 times the 1179 and that would give you your school property tax amount uh, based on this projected uh, mill rate remember this is only the school property tax portion of your property tax bill the technical college uh, the state the county your municipality all uh, also levy a property tax um, I think I can say with 100% certainty the largest portion of your property tax bill is going to be the school district portion of your tax bill So comparing that to last year, last year the actual tax rate, mill rate, excuse me, was $11.40. If we look at those same property values and look at the property school property tax amount last year versus this year, you can get an idea of what the school property tax actual amount is going to go up from one year to the next. So on that $100,000 property, uh, $39. On the $150,000 property, $58.50 and on the $200,000 property $78 the school district uh, portion now in reality many uh, houses change in uh, fair market value from year to year um, in this illustration we show the 2012 property at $100,000 and imagine it continued through you'd see the at $100,000 in the next year, you'd see the $1,179 uh, or $39 increase year on year. But what if that property went up in value by 3%? Uh, the fair market sales of other properties in your neighborhood revealed that uh, homes are selling higher than the assessed value by 3%. What the Department of Revenue would require the village town to do at that point in time would be increase the value of your home, fair market value, by 3%. If that were the case, then your property tax bill for the school would be $1,214.37. So $74.37 increase rather than the $39 increase if your property had stayed at the same value. Now, years ago, we didn't talk about this because I think it was over 20 years ago that this last happened. I think it was in the early 80s when property values went down. But guess what? It happened again here in the last three years. At some properties, the value went down. And that means that even though the mill rate's going up, if your property value is going down, um, you could potentially see a reduction. In this case, a 2% reduction in the fair market value of the property uh, results in a $1,155.42 increase. So uh, a $15.42 increase rather than 39. The whole purpose of these tables is just to illustrate that it's not the school tax amount that the school district sets or the equalized valuation that determines the property, va uh, the property tax amount paid by each homeowner. It's really a combination of those events. And so when one person comes to me and says, why did my tax bill go up and somebody I know 
down in the town of Onalaska, it went down. Much of that has to do with the revaluation. Francis is smiling. His never goes down in the town of Onalaska. <laughs> But it gets at the point of fluctuation uh, across the district in property tax increases uh, or reductions from year to year. Well, we've taken a look at 2012 and 13, and uh, this chart, which is found on page 41 of the annual report, is one of the fiscal performance measures uh, that the school board uses, uh, finance committee uses, and administration uses in developing the budget. Um, this does not portray the 2013 projected $11.79. Uh, Holman would be the blue line on this chart. Uh, it's not necessarily good to be the highest number on this chart, uh, but that is where Holman's at. And we tend to be about $2 above the state average and our MBC comparable. Reason for that is the construction that we've had in this school district and the bonds we've had to take out to pay for that construction. And that accounts for about $2, $1.85 to $2, depending upon the year, of our tax rate. And so we're distinguished from the other groups in that we've had to build schools and, and we have a tax burden associated with that. Uh, so last year, you can see we were uh, at $11.40, and um, the MVC and state average were both at that $10.11. So we have a tax rate that runs higher and consistently higher because of the debt. You can see here the arrows, a couple of sets of arrows. These illustrate where the targets are. One of the targets is uh, comparing the school district to the state average. Uh, and not beginning to widen from the state average, but being respectful of how Holman compares to the state average. And the other, uh, in red here, represent upper and lower limits based upon our historical average. Uh, the intent of this goal is to not have dramatic fluctuations in the tax rate from one year to the next. Um, when it comes to taxes, people tend to appreciate steady. Um, if you have a taxes go up rapidly in one year and then down in the next year people remember the wrap it up but tend to forget the downs pretty quickly uh, so we try to be relatively stable in our tax rate which I think you can see from the illustration um, has been something we've accomplished in, in recent past I should mention I do remain uh, hopeful that the 1179 will come in a little bit um, lower um, but there are many projections involved here. Uh, equalized valuation of the communities, um, third Friday count in student enrollment um, are a couple of the major variables still in play. So before I go to the next section, any questions on the uh, school tax or mill rate that we're projecting? This next um, series of numbers talks about the proposed tax levy projected. It's actually an increase over the prior year uh, in an amount of $683,395, a 4.58% 4 increase in the tax levy amount. Um, this is the full amount allowed under the state law. Um, as allowed under revenue limit formula. The revenue limit formula for 1314 actually allows the district to generate $854,000 in additional revenue compared to last year. And the state is increasing the aid that they're sending us by $346,000. And the way the revenue limit formula works is they determine how much revenue you can generate you subtract from that the amount of state aid and the difference is the additional tax used to fund operations of the district so subtracting the increase in state aid from the increase in revenue limit you see the 517,000 you might say wait a minute Jay that's still not 683 you're right because we have referendum approved debt and the tax levy for that is outside the revenue limit. 
And in this next year, we will have to levy an additional $175,000 to cover our debt obligations. And the two of those do add up to $683,000. So where did the increase, the proposed increase come from? What were the changes? Uh, that identifies in most simplistic terms uh, where the change <coughs> came from. So uh, in review, uh, the 2013 proposed is that $15,614,584 uh, the amount last year was $14,931,189 uh, in comparison then that $683,395 or 4.58%. Um, on that blue document you have, that two-sided sheet, on the bottom of page two, you should see something that looks like this. Well, it's not actually on the bottom. It's second from the bottom there. Uh, but this is the public notification we made, um, not just with the school district's budget, but the proposed property tax levy you can see there labeled. And you can see the general fund, debt service mm -hmm. fund, and total amount, as well as the percentage increase, and two years prior information uh, presented to you as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the equalized valuation, uh, property values in the school district is an important factor in determining the final mill rate. Uh, this chart provides equalized valuation information back to 2002-3. Uh, here, Holman is the blue line. And um, you can see the MVC average as the pink line. And then you can see the state average um, in the uh, black line with yellow uh, triangles. And you can see the MVC and Holman have actually fared much better than the state, have they, in the last few years. So property values have uh, dropped across the state, uh, but in this region we seem to have a housing market that stands up better to the tough economic times. Uh, we are projecting at this point in time a 1.14% growth, a small increase, but an increase uh, nonetheless, in the equalized property value. 1.15% uh, is about $15 million in uh, property tax base growth, but uh, we have over $1 billion of property uh, value in the school community. I would mention that the growth over the last five years has averaged uh, closer to 6%. Um, so we're looking at a smaller growth, uh, but growth nonetheless this next year. And as I mentioned, the equalized property value plays into the tax rate determination. Uh, this is the basic formula for calculating the tax rate. You take the tax levy amount, which we talked about, what it will be for next year. You divide that by the equalized valuation, uh, and that gives you a tax rate. And here you can see the tax levy amount up 4.58. You can see the equalized property value amount up 1.15. Ideally, we'd like to see those switched because if you had the property value going up by a larger percentage than the tax rate, you'd end up with a mill rate drop, but uh, that's not the way it's working out for this next year. And then you can see the result in tax rate. Sometimes people use the word tax rate and mill rate interchangeably. The tax rate is the raw number. The mill rate says per $100,000 of property value. So you just move the decimal over three places to the right to convert the tax rate into the mill rate. And again, that's a 3.42% increase. Again, many projections, preliminary revenue limit, uh, September membership counts will help to finalize that. Not until October will we probably have those values. This is based on preliminary equalized valuation. The equalized valuations for each of the municipalities have been certified to them by the Department of Revenue. After that's done, then they try to sort out the school districts because the boundaries for school districts and municipalities are not coterminous. Um, they're kind of overlapping in some, uh, well, ancient ways, I guess you'd say, when they decided to score, form the school district of home and they let people pick. And uh, they didn't always pick along municipal boundary lines. Um, so 
Uh, we have um, uh, some of our townships and village uh, are entirely within, but others not. So we can't just use the um, values released to the municipalities. We have to be patient and wait for those uh, recalculated for the school district. Um, this is also a preliminary equalized aid amount used in uh, the projection. Um, later on tonight, because of all these projections, the motion that we've traditionally uh, used for adoption of a tax levy is this one, be it resolved that the Board of Education be given the authority to establish the tax levy up to the full amount allowed under the state's uh, under the state imposed revenue limits as is necessary to support the district and uh, we will present that at that time during the annual meeting uh, tonight uh, questions on mill rate or tax levy or how we got to that number yes in the back row mr. Banashek I'll try repeating the question It, it'll record better if you use that mic. Thank you. Okay, my name is Michael Banashik. I'm a 34-year resident of uh, this school district and have been quite involved with the facility committee or uh, buildings and grounds committee for a number of years, taking a bit of a hiatus, but it also gives me a chance to think about a lot of this. And uh, one specific thing that uh, I've thought about is there's a couple of groups within the community that I think are increasing in population. Number one, us baby boomers. And so we have a lot of people with more fixed incomes and also young people that may not have any children but are living in the district that are paying for the district, uh, school district. And my calculation over the last few years is about 55% of my real estate taxes go to the school board. And so subsequently, it's a pretty important thing uh, uh, the education in my mind is is a priority but we really have to watch and be very diligent in these increases you know I look at the kind of percentage increase that we're projecting uh, for someone with a fixed income and I'm partially there I do have some variable but not a whole lot but uh, everything else is going up and including my real estate taxes so subsequently uh, it's not only what we're doing but who's going to have to pay for it and I think that's a really important factor for for the consideration in all of this is that uh, there is a fixed level and especially with the population that's aging and isn't going to have as much money and they don't have as much of a vested interest you know I had a son that spent four years in the district going to school but that's four out of 34 years so I don't have any grandkids any nephews nieces whatever so I have to be a real believer that everything is done uh, most effectively but anyway my kind of bottom line point is that these groups that aren't going to have the benefit direct benefit of any of this need to be considered and especially with reasonably sizable increases when I look at that percentage compared to supposedly what our, our uh, inflation rate is which is a bogus number anyway from the federal government but the fact is that uh, that it's someone's got to pay for it enough said thank you any other uh, questions or comments I have a few more slides to present but it seems like a reasonable breaking point for the comments questions thank you mr. Benashi um, so I'm going to progress to some uh, notable uh, budget differences from last year's unaudited to this year's uh, proposed budget. And for this, you will want to have the buff colored um, sheet. And in fact, the first section of that sheet should uh, look an awful lot like what I have on the screen now. You'll notice uh, line numbers along the left-hand side and column numbers across the top. I'm going to try really hard to refer to things by um, column and row because when I start saying things like uh, fund balance undesignated, I, that just usually doesn't get people to where they need to be. So um, I'm going to ask you to look on page one at line seven. 
and column D. And line seven, column D, is the uh, ending fund balance uh, that we're projecting for next year. Uh, now look to the left, one column on that same line, and you can see the ending fund balance from the prior year, which, if you look up to line one in column D, is the beginning fund balance. Makes sense, doesn't it? We finish with a fund balance, and that serves as the starting fund balance for the next year. And you can see a difference between the 2013-14 beginning fund balance and ending fund balance. And uh, Dr. Carlson made reference to this earlier, that uh, through some outstanding efforts uh, last year, we finished with a surplus. Uh, we're at this point in time budgeting what's referred to as a deficit budget uh, for the upcoming year, a difference of $262,000. Um, more in expenses um, than revenue for uh, the year. Uh, this is a planned um, deficit budget. Uh, we believe that we have a fund balance uh, that's adequate to meet the intended uh, purpose of a fund balance and uh, able to find expenditures that really represent one-time expenditures uh, being funded next year uh, with dollars earned as revenue in prior years. Uh, we would not do this with ongoing expenses because uh, fund balance is kind of like a savings account that you've accumulated over a number of years and uh, you just can't keep living on that kind of savings account. Um, that's used for one-time expenses. And so that's the intent for next year. Uh, I think an important uh, item to make the public aware of. Uh, this slide provides further detail on the differences between between the beginning and ending fund balance, uh, you can see the fund balance decrease of $262,000. Um, the information between the beginning and the ending fund balance breaks down into uh, really a operating deficit, operating budget deficit of $319,000 and a structural surplus of $507,000. The operational deficit really describes or represents our ongoing day-to-day -day spending in the district. And those things that we bring revenue in for in one year and spend it out in that same year, that's the portion of the budget that we're going to have this deficit in. We also have a structural portion of our budget and we're going to have a structural surplus. These are revenues and expenses that uh, really span multiple years. The best example enlisted here is our sinking fund. We receive revenue in one year and set it aside to address capital maintenance items in both technology and in facilities in future years. And so what we're saying next year is that structurally we're going to continue to do that for those future maintenance needs. We're going to actually take in 122,000. There are some needs that will draw that down in the sinking fund, $65,000 worth of needs, but we're gonna end up with a $57,000 surplus in that structural portion of our budget. The operational portion, we're gonna spend $319,000 more than we're gonna bring in. And what you see in the change between the beginning and ending fund balance is really the combination of those two numbers, the $319,000 and the $57,000. Moving on, if you look at page 1, line 10, this slide shows the increases in taxes in general operations. The first portion of this presentation covered that uh, specifically. So as presented in earlier slides, the general fund tax levy is anticipated to increase $517,000. If you did the arithmetic from last year to this year, Francis maybe has his calculator out already. All right, it's $536,000. It's a little bit more than what I said earlier. The difference is that the Department of Public Instruction makes us record mobile, mobile home fees on this same line and we anticipate those to go up as well. So that's what makes the difference between the 517,000 I talked about going up earlier and the 536 you'll calculate as a difference on that line, the difference being mobile home fees. On page one, still moving to line 31, 
Uh, this is state aid, categorical aid. Um, categorical aid comes to us in the form of common school funds, sometimes referred to as library aid, transportation aid for transporting pupils to and from school, bilingual, bicultural aid, and other aids uh, that are specifically targeted for programs or services. This amount's going up by $75 per pupil next year, and that increase is reflected in line 31. Line 32 is the state general aid, sometimes called equalized aid that's received from the state. Uh, this amount is provided as an estimate by the state in July uh, and is based upon our prior year expenditures and property values and student counts. The increase in aid is a result of additional general aid being appropriated at the state biennial budget level. So the states put more money into uh, general uh, state aid. Each district's impact is different and independent. Um, not every district got the same percentage increase. Uh, there's a very detailed formula the state uses to send monies to school districts. So the percentage here may differ, is my point, than uh, what our neighbors may have received. Uh, it may be noteworthy that uh, you can see how much of our budget is made up of that state general equalized aid, significant portion of our budget. Uh, moving on to page two, uh, we change from the revenue side of the budget to the expenditure side. There's a subtotal for instruction, um, an amount on line 65, an amount of $19.9 million. That represents 48% of the total general fund budget uh, routed to uh, meet instructional needs. Lines uh, 59 and 60 uh, are specifically undifferentiated curriculum, primarily at the elementary school level and regular curriculum, uh, primarily at the middle school and high school levels. And that makes up the majority of our budget in the instructional area. Line 65, the subtotal for instruction is uh, $1.6 million greater than the prior year. This is largely due to salary and benefit expenditure increases, not only the increases in existing employees' wages, but as our staff uh, and services we provide continue to grow with our enrollment, um, the additional salary and benefit cost of new staff. Um, there were special allocations in 13-14 to instructional services that will be ongoing and there was a one-time common core and educator effectiveness allocation uh, that helped create that $1.6 million increase. Moving on to line 75, uh, the support services uh, budget amount of $14.6 million. Line 75, that represents about 35% of the general fund budget. The amount in the 1314 column, column D, shows an increase of $370,000 over the prior year. Again, like under the instructional side, this is an increase due primarily to salaries and benefits. Uh, in addition to the salary and benefits increases, there was technology infrastructure allocation. That was a one-time allocation, one-time meaning for 1314.